is uh, David Henderson. Uh, I'm a wing commander in the Royal Australian Air Force Reserve. I spent 24 years in permanent Air Force and uh, the remainder of my career in the Reserve. Keith Jurd and myself were the first pilots posted directly off pilot's course to go to 12 Squadron, um, which I wasn't too happy about because I wanted to go to 9 Squadron, but uh, having gone to 12 Squadron, I'm glad I went there first. It was a, a great squadron. Um, we actually did a uh, helicopter conversion on Iroquois at number 5 Squadron before we then went on to 12 Squadron and did our conversion onto the Chinook. Um, I started fairly late in life. I joined the Air Force when I was 20, 25 and a half, um, 26 being the maximum age you could be, but I'd done a mechanical engineering degree before I joined, and so uh, I ended up a flying officer rather than a pilot officer when I graduated from pilot's course. Um, so when I arrived at the squadron, I was probably 26. When I turned up at the squadron, luckily I, I was travelling with Keith Jurd, and so we both turned up at the squadron at the same time, but I found it very easy to assimilate into the squadron. The uh, squadron executives were excellent, really friendly people, and the rest of the uh, squadron members were very friendly, as were the uh, loadmasters, flight engineers and ground crew who had to put up with these bog rats turning up straight off pilot's course. and. Um, yeah, it was a very easy assimilation. People like Ted Bark and Des Long, um, who did a lot of our training, excellent. Um, well, first of all, we did our conversion course, which, which took us through the basics of flying circuits, um, carrying external loads, flying the aircraft at very high weights with internal loads, which is probably the most dangerous uh, things you can do with a Chinook, because if you lose an engine, you can't get rid of internal loads. Whereas with external loads, just push a button and it's gone. Um, probably the first significant uh, exercise I remember was hold tight and tiger tail, which was an army support exercise up at Townsville. And um, the thing I remember about that was that we had two aircraft and we had one of the first camouflaged aircraft. Previous to that, they'd all been green with a white roof um, but we uh, started camouflaging the aircraft and we had the first aircraft camouflaged up there. About what, what time, about what year was that? That would have been 1978 as well. 78. Okay. Yeah, late 78. I spent the first half of 1978 doing helicopter conversion down in Canberra. Then I came to the squadron, did my conversion on the Chinook and then um, went on to exercises. Some of the exercises, the Army exercises, occurred in the high range training area um, above Townsville. And it was reasonable altitude, like you could get up to about 2,000 feet altitude, and in summertime it was quite hot. And aircraft suffer when they're high and hot. It's uh, referred to as density altitude. And the higher the density altitude, the, the less the aircraft can carry. And the big difference between the Chinook and the Iroquois is the Chinook is far more capable of carrying heavy loads in high density altitude situations. Whereas a, uh, an Iroquois at that time, and even later the, the Black Hawks, could probably only carry one gun and one bag of ammunition and possibly some of the crew. The Chinook could carry two guns, four bags of ammunition and all the crews inside the aircraft in one go. So the Chinook gave the Army and the Air Force the capability of, of lifting far bigger loads and far heavier loads and carrying them further. Well, I remember that uh, we were having a ball at Ambly, an officer's mess ball, and um, Ted Bark asked if there was something we could do as a central um, motive for the table to set us apart from all the other squadrons and um, I suggested that we build a baby Chinook and uh, he agreed and so I got together with some of the ground crew across the road from the headquarters building and we fashioned a baby Chinook out of foam, fiberglass and, uh, and some metal and um, the ground crew painted it and 
it was a, a great hit at the ball and later on it became a um, a uh, mainstay of all the Chinook displays when one of the Chinooks would give birth to the baby Chinook. The other thing I remember about uh, the very early days was our first deployment to Papua New Guinea and that occurred in the end of 1978 and the reason we'd go to Papua New Guinea is because it had higher temperatures and higher mountains um, and therefore you end up with higher density altitude and we wanted to practice the crews in flying the aircraft in very high density altitude situations. Um, while we were there, one of the caribous from 38 Squadron, I think it was, um, while taking off from Elliptoman airfield in the Highlands, actually ran off the airfield and crashed off the side of the, air, uh, off the, side of the airfield. And it was decided that uh, 12 Squadron, seeing they had Chinooks in New Guinea at the time, would go up and assist uh, the squadron recover the aircraft because they couldn't fly it out. And so um, a team from Air Movement's Training and Development Unit at Richmond and some of the squadron members from 38 Squadron um, flew up to Elliptoman and um, pulled the aircraft apart. They took the engines off, they took the wings off, they took the tail off and uh, we used a Chinook to move all of those parts, firstly down to Telefoman on the Sepik River and then to Weewak, where it was loaded onto a uh, Navy ship and brought back to Australia. And that aircraft was repaired and uh, was flying again before too long. I know that uh, up in New Guinea, there was quite a number over the years of aircraft recoveries. Uh, in particular, I think we recovered about three or four Boston aircraft that had crashed during World War II. And um, they were brought back to Ambly, where they were rebuilt, not to flying condition, but to static condition. And as part of the agreement with the Papua New Guinea government uh, to allow us to take those aircraft out of New Guinea, um, we refurbished one of them and it went back to the uh, War Museum in Port Moresby, and that was uh, our repayment for letting us take the others out. Um, there was a Britain Norman Islander that crashed up in New Guinea, and um, some of the squadron went up to recover that uh, with the Air Movement's training and development people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when the aircraft was flying along in the slings, started flying itself and it <laughs> rotated through about 90 degrees and so when they got back to where they were taking it they had to actually put it down on one of its wings first before they put it down. Because of the uh, large distances involved in, in the Australian environment um, we eventually got long-range fuel tanks which were developed here in Australia to fit inside the aircraft and then feed into the, the exterior fuel tanks as you flew along. Um, I remember there is, in the very early day, or in the early days that I was there, um, there was a long range operation where they flew a, a Chinook up to Malaysia to recover a Nuri helicopter uh, out of the jungle up there. And that, at the, that stage, was the longest deployment of an Australian helicopter uh, in the history of the RAF. And Des Long flew that up to, uh, up to Malaysia and brought it back. Australia is a very dusty environment and um, we did eventually learn how to land in really dusty conditions and that is basically you just uh, keep moving forward rather than come to the hover and you get the back wheels on the ground before the dust catches up with you and once, that, once you've got the back wheels on the ground you're fairly stabilised and you can sit the aircraft down. Well some of the, some of the original pilots that uh, were uh, here when the uh, Chinook first came into service actually did their training in the United States. So they went to America and uh, a lot of that would have been covered uh, in their training in the US. But um, I don't know if the US has got more dust than us, but we've got a lot of dust. 
Most of the uh, jobs that uh, involved supporting civilian organisations were done when I was at uh, AMTDU, Air Movements Training and Development Unit, because I was the Rotary Wing Project Officer down there. That was my posting straight after 12, my first tour at 12 Squadron. And some of the jobs I remember was uh, we put a heavy air conditioning unit on top of a high rise building here in Brisbane. Um, we took an old Brisbane tram after it had been cleaned up and we lifted it from uh, Redcliffe Peninsula uh, over to Morton Island and put it on a uh, curtain artificial reef. And so that was its last flight was uh, under a 12 Squadron Chinook. We also uh, tried to put a tower on top of a platform out in uh, Morton Bay, but unfortunately then it ended up with the tower falling off the platform and into the water. And of course the, the reason for that was that when you're hovering high above water, and you had to hover high because you had the height of the tower plus the length of the strops holding the tower, when you're hovering very high over water, there's no ground reference. And so it's very hard to uh, maintain a hover, a steady hover in that sort of situation. Because the Chinook was a very basic aircraft. It didn't have auto hover or auto pilots. Everything was hand flown. And so that ended up going into the water. Um, but 12 Squadron, being the great squadron it is, uh, we then recovered that tower from out of the water and it was eventually put up by a, a barge with a crane on it. We've been involved in a number of uh, ship rescues with salvage companies. Um, one was in Port Hedland over in Western Australia where uh, an iron ore carrier uh, ran aground in the channel leading into Port Hedland and uh, 12 Squadron was involved in that by lifting uh, a bulldozer and uh, other equipment out to the ship and then what they did was cut holes in the bulkheads and they bulldozed the iron ore from one end of the ship to the other where they had a set of conveyors and they just put the, uh, the iron ore over the side and they did that until they got enough weight off the nose of the ship to uh, lift it. Uh, another ship rescue we did was out here on Bribey Island um, there was a ship that uh, was coming into the port of Brisbane and he failed to make a turn at one of the uh, channel markers and ran straight aground on top of, on the tip of, northern tip of uh, Bribey Island. And so um, we started flying the containers on the ship across the Pummerstone Passage to Caloundra where we uh, commandeered a, uh, a large parking area and the Chinooks would bring the containers over, put them on the car park, then a large forklift would lift them, put them on the back of trucks, and then they'd go straight to Brisbane. And we lifted enough containers off the front of the ship so that again, the bow of the ship at high tide was afloat and they managed to get the, the ship off. Uh, the only difficulty we found there is um, they would tell us how much a container weighed and when we pulled power, when we got to the power required to lift something of that weight, there was no way it was going to move. So a lot of these containers were a lot heavier than they stated on the manifest. At that time, the Chinook was the only aircraft with uh, enough lift capability to be able to do those sorts of jobs. Um, quite often we were very close to our limit as far as uh, being able to lift particular loads. Um, I remember there was a uh, D4 bulldozer up in New Guinea that we had to fly into, uh, I think the place was called Canabia, and um, they were going to build a road from there down to Kerama, and to shorten the time they decided to start at both ends and work towards the middle, so we had to fly this D4 bulldozer up to Kerama, sorry, yeah, up to um, Canabia. And uh, the first day we tried to do it, there was low cloud. And so the, uh, the fellow in charge of the mission up there who'd been waiting like four years for this bulldozer to arrive, all he saw was the bulldozer fly past and because of the cloud, he couldn't see the Chinook. <laughs> 
So we just saw this bulldozer go past. However, we did get it in the next day. I remember when uh, Scipio Dwyer and myself, when I was a bog rat at the squadron, we uh, flew up to Rockhampton and we were uh, at the mouth of the Fitzroy River when we flew underneath a thunderstorm and, and got into a microburst, which is a very strong downward uh, flow of air. And uh, I can remember we had maximum power set and we were still going down at about 1500 feet a minute. And uh, luckily, when the air comes down, as it gets near the ground, it, it flattens out. And uh, I think we stopped about 15 or 20 feet above the mangroves at the mouth of the river before we actually stopped descending and then we managed to fly out of it. And that was a fairly hairy uh, time. But uh, I, I have to add that in my seven years flying Chinooks, I was very, very rarely scared. I, I'd say that was about the only time. Chinook's great aeroplane. I mentioned earlier that uh, I wanted to go to 9 Squadron and ended up at 12 Squadron. And having flown a, a twin-engine helicopter rather than a single-engine helicopter, I started to understand what a, what a benefit that was to have gone to the Chinook in the first place. Um, there was a number of times I've had to shut down an engine and um, there was an instance uh, when I was flying from Port Moresby back to Horn Island, which is at uh, Thursday Island Airport, and about halfway across the, uh, the Coral Sea, we got an indication that there was uh, metallic parts in one of the gearbox lubrication systems. And so I diverted to um, Murray Island, which is about halfway across, and landed there. And the other Chinook that was traveling with us, uh, he came and landed there as well. And when we pulled the filter out uh, of the lubrication system, the flight engineer showed me and he just had a handful of bits and pieces of metal where the uh, gearbox was starting to disintegrate. And the funny thing there was that uh, we rang the customs agent in uh, Horn Island. He said, oh, you shouldn't have stopped at Murray Island, you know. We, We've got to do clearances on you and all that. I said, look, what's I send the other Chinook over and pick you up, bring you out here. You can do the clearance here and then we'll fly you back. He said, oh, OK, that'd be good. <laughs> uh, as far as ground crew are concerned, I think the, the guys at 12 Squadron were some of the, the best people that I've met in the Air Force. They were very capable, as were the uh, senior NCOs and the warrant officers who ran the engineering side of things. Mind you, when we did a test flight after a major maintenance, we always took the ground crew who did the maintenance with us on the test flight. <laughs> so it was in their best interests to make sure they did a good job. And I can't say enough about the uh, loadmasters and flight engineers who flew with us. They were excellent, uh, particularly the flight engineers. Quite often we'd be in the middle of nowhere and get mechanical problems and I don't know of many situations where um, they couldn't fix the thing to at least get us back to somewhere to, to get help. Um, they did an excellent job. Uh, I think the thing about 12 Squadron was that uh, when we went away, we took our uh, engineering people with us um, and they lived with us in the field, and that's where we spent most of our time, living with the army under tents in the field, uh, unlike the uh, transport drivers who <laughs> used to stay under six-star hotels. And the only reason they stayed under six stars is because there's no seven-star. <laughs> we, we used to live under a thousand stars, and you, you get a certain camaraderie building up when you're living in the field with uh, the crew, the uh, ground crew, and the flight engineers and loadmasters. I remember one loadmaster, Sandy Roman. He was a chef before uh, he joined the Air Force, I believe, and he could make an excellent meal out of uh, out of a ration pack. And Sandy was always uh, always cooking and getting up at about four o'clock in the morning and whistling around the campfire until someone yelled out from their tent, for God's sake, shut up. <laughs> we used to deploy into the field a lot of the time 
and we would ca carry vehicles with us in the aircraft. We'd carry tentage, we'd carry camouflage nets. Mind you, the Chinook was so big that we had great difficulty trying to camouflage it, but all our vehicles and all our camps were camouflaged. Um, and we took fridges with us, of course, <laughs> and um, piles of, uh, of soft drinks. Quite often we'd set up a little stall and uh, sell the soft drinks at cost price to the army guys trudging past. I must also uh, say that we did a lot of work with uh, the army's nine pet platoon, petroleum platoon, because they were the guys who set up the refueling and uh, arming points and uh, would refuel us when we uh, needed fuel out in the field. Quite often they'd have large bladders of fuel and we'd come in, we'd blow crap all over them. And at the end of the day, these guys just had two little white rings where they were wearing their goggles. And uh, we had a lot of time for the nine pet platoon guys and we'd provide them with uh, free drinks and uh, uh, quite often they'd, they'd camp with us as well. So uh, they were great guys, the nine pet platoon. Generally, the, our work, working relationship with the Army was excellent, particularly with the artillery. Uh, we did a lot of work moving artillery and ammunition and, and people. And um, I became very close friends with a lot of the artillery officers that worked in the field with us. Um, occasionally you would come upon uh, someone who didn't fully understand the limitations of the aircraft and be insisting on us doing something which was completely out of the question. Um, I remember one army officer wanted us to uh, continuing, continue to move his guns into the night. And um, it was an administrative move, which means it wasn't a tactical move. And we tried to explain to him that to fly the guns at night, we have to climb to a higher altitude to get safety clearance from the mountains. We have to fly larger patterns and then do slow approaches in to the uh, night landing aids and uh, that it would take us far longer to move the guns in at night time than if we just knocked off at dusk and the next morning we could put them in far faster and he would get all his guns into the location uh, faster doing that because we would have run out of crew duty time which meant that we couldn't start the next morning until later because we'd flown into the night and so uh, doing it the way he wanted to do it he wouldn't have got his guns in as fast but you can't explain that to them sometimes. Uh, when the squadron was disbanded I was the executive officer of the squadron working for Graham Chalmers and um, we argued strongly against shutting the squadron down because there was nothing in Australia, even though the Black Hawk had been introduced into service, there was nothing in Australia that could do what the Chinooks could do. And um, the story that was spread around was that the Black Hawks could, could take up the slack and do everything the Chinooks could do. But that was nowhere near the truth. And, uh, uh, we argued strongly against shutting the squadron down, but uh, funnily enough, uh, I was also an instructor on the Chinook and uh, I had two new pilots with me in the aircraft doing uh, General Flying One, which was the first flight of their training on the Chinook. And um, I was out in the, uh, in the training area with these two pilots and I got a call from air traffic control saying, uh, come back now to the squadron. The chief of air force wishes to talk to the squadron. And when we got back, of course, um, chief of air force stood up and uh, told us the squadron was being disbanded, which was a bit of a blow to these two students who'd just started their first flight. But we actually, because uh, there was about nine months before the squadron actually shut down, we actually finished their conversion onto type. So they got some time flying the Chinook, which uh, I'm sure they enjoyed. All of the uh, people at 12 Squadron were posted to other, other squadrons or other units um, to employ their, their, their skills and capabilities. Uh, I have a 
photograph of the uh, planning board at 12 Squadron and uh, near all the pilots and loadmasters' names, someone had drawn the type of aircraft they were going to. So a bunch of the guys went to, um, to Maritime to fly Orions. And uh, funnily enough, next to my name was a big desk. Well, the thing was that the Army didn't want the Chinooks when the squadron shut down. So the Chinooks actually went into storage at the 12 Squadron facility and they were uh, cocooned in uh, special wrap and each aircraft had a dehumidifier running into the cocoon so that they wouldn't uh, deteriorate. And so we kept them there for a number of years and uh, our Warrant Officer Engineering, Barry Redshaw, who was our last woe eng, um, he actually was uh, staying down at the squadron to look after the aircraft. Um, and uh, eventually the decision was made, once they realised that uh, they couldn't do without the Chinooks, the uh, decision was made to send those Chinooks back to America and have them upgraded to D models and then they came back to uh, C Squadron of 5 Aviation Regiment up in Townsville to the Army. The Chinook is a capability which uh, any Army or Defence Force uh, would, would embrace because it is such a, a great capability. Uh, the ability to move heavy loads quickly um, is, is something that the Army really uh, value. I remember that uh, we decided to fit the Chinooks while we were flying them with the Doppler navigation system, which would make navigating the aircraft a lot easier. And uh, it took so long to get approval and get the equipment that when they were ready to install it, GPS had come in and the equipment was uh, <laughs> no, lo no longer useful. The Army uh, now, they got D model Chinooks uh, back from America and uh, they've since upgraded and increased the number of Chinooks that they have and they're now up to the F model. And some of the advantages of the F model is that it's got uh, three hooks, whereas we only had one hook. And with one hook, central suspension of a load, quite often we would have loads go uncontrolled in the air. And uh, now with three hooks, they can actually hold them from, from diverging because a load will always turn so it's got the maximum drag. And um, there were quite a number of loads which uh, caused us a lot of problems. Yeah, I, I think of all the squadrons I've been in in the Air Force, 12 Squadron was the happiest squadron. It's like fantasy land. <laughs> it's the happiest kingdom of them all. Um, and of course, this is a combination of um, the commanding officers that we had, of the executives that we had at the squadron, of the ground crew and air crew that flew the squadron. But quite often with, with a change of, of COs or, or senior executives, there will be a change in the mood at the squadron. But 12 Squadron in the time that I was there never seemed to change. It was always a very, uh, very happy place to be. Uh, I'm sure there were moments where people called me a bastard and <laughs> other things, but um, no, it was, it was a good squadron. And I was away for about five years between my first and second tours. Um, but my first ground job was at as I mentioned, AMTDU, Air Movements Training and Development Unit, as the Rotary Wing Project Officer, which meant that I looked after the lashing and loading of, of stuff in the aircraft and external load carriage. And so I spent a lot of time at 12 Squadron in that job, even though I wasn't posted to 12 Squadron. And, and uh, it just seemed to me that uh, it, it was a, a very happy squadron the whole time. In my early days there, there was Scipio Dwyer, who was a, uh, a really funny character. I, I enjoyed Skippy and his wife Jenny's company all the time. Unfortunately, Skippy was killed in a Mackie doing a low-level aerobatics practice over in Western Australia. Um, another 
character was Peter Hope, who unfortunately also was killed in a, an aircraft crash in a Sioux helicopter up at Caboolture after he'd left the Air Force and was uh, doing a checkout on, on a, a pilot on the Sioux. But Hopi was, was, was funny, he was a very loud man and uh, if he didn't like something he'd slam the filing cabinet door and yell out, that's a poor show! And consequently his nickname was Poor Show Pete. Um, Brum Watson, yeah there was, there was lots of characters in the squadron uh, and I remember them all very fondly and it was great at the reunion to, to catch up with a lot of them as well. Once when I was acting commanding officer of the squadron, this was in my second tour, um, I got a phone call in the middle of the night from headquarters air command down at Glenbrook saying that a, a yacht had been uh, dismasted and was uh, in trouble out off the, off the coast. So at two o'clock in the morning, I had to ring around, get a crew together, uh, get the engineers to come in and get an aircraft ready and uh, we launched an aircraft just after dawn uh, to go out and that was a very difficult rescue. Jack Frost and uh, Fergie were the, uh, were the pilots on board and um, they went out and they found this yacht and they managed to get all the crew off the yacht and uh, safely back to Brisbane Airport. Uh, it was very difficult for the same reason that the tower positioning was difficult because in, in a rolling sea it's very difficult to maintain a hover, a steady hover and uh, Jack Frost did, the, uh, did a great job in getting those people up. With that rescue we did use a, a state emergency service winch man to go down into the water because most of our load masters are a bit old. <laughs> and didn't fancy going in, and, and we didn't have the equipment, we didn't have wetsuits and that sort of thing. So uh, Brett Mitchell uh, was a winch man, a uh, civilian winch man, and he went down and actually got the people into the, into the harness uh, so we could winch them up into the aircraft. Um, and we had a doctor on board, Greg Hampson, and uh, Greg did a good job looking after the people once they were winched up into the aircraft. This was a, around the period when the squadron was looking down the barrel of disbandment. So thinking ahead, I grabbed my video camera and gave it to Greg Hampson uh, to take out on the aircraft and he took some video of the rescue and uh, all that video was on the lead, it was the lead item on every channel in the news that night. Uh, as part of Expo, each country had a day where it was dedicated to that country. And on the day that Australia was celebrating, we did a, a synchronous display with two Chinooks uh, on the, over the Brisbane River in front of the expo site. And I remember John Kennedy came in from the west and he came low in over the Victoria Bridge. And I came from the opposite direction and I came around the top of uh, Stefan's penthouse at the other end of the, the, the river and we came down the river and passed and then did our synchronous display and that was, uh, that was a lot of fun being that low over the river. Uh, we did quite a lot of synchronous displays uh, both at air shows and, and at Expo um, and the the reason I think that, that helicopter displays are so popular at air shows is because we are there right in front of the crowd, whereas the high speed jets whiz past, you know, and then five minutes later they whiz past again, whereas the Chinooks concentrated their display right in front of the people. And of course, um, with two large machines like that moving uh, in opposite directions, while we've got quite a large margin of safety, between us from where the crowd sits, it looks like the aircraft are very, very close. And so it was always very popular with the, uh, with the people at the air shows. And of course the uh, baby Chinook being born was also very popular. Um, we used to have one Chinook with the hook up and another Chinook with the hook down. <laughs> so we had a male and a female and it was the one with the hook up that gave birth to the, uh, to the baby Chinook. <laughs> we were lucky enough in uh, 1989 before we shut down to have a reunion of, uh, to celebrate 
the formation of the squadron in 1939 and we had something like a hundred World War II guys come along and uh, we did a ceremony down at Laverton where the squadron was formed and uh, we then moved up to Darwin and had another celebration up in Darwin and of course a lot of the guys that came were, were original members of the squadron in 1939 and uh, they came up to revisit the uh, revisit Darwin and see the places where they'd been so long ago and it was really interesting and good value to talk to the guys from World War II. Well, some of them, some of the fellows that attended our uh, reunion in 2019 were also at the reunion in 1989. So they're doing very well, very well indeed. But I made a lot of friends from the, the World War II guys and uh, actually went and stayed with a few of them up and down the, up and down the east coast of Australia. It was, it was really interesting and uh, nice people.